friend of mine named Sarah. Now, when Sarah was in high school, she liked nice things, right? Big house, nice cars, pool. I think everyone likes those things, right? Anybody like those? All right? yeah. Everybody likes those things. Okay, just want to make sure we're all on the same page. So, right now. so she asked her parents one day, Mom, Dad, how can I make enough money to buy all these things that I want? And the advice that Sarah's parents told her is, I think, something that we've all heard at one point in our own life. They said, Sarah, if you really want to make the money to get all of this crap that you want, I need you to do three things. One, focus on getting the best grades absolutely possible. Two, get a solid safe degree. Don't get nothing too crazy. And three, try to join up with a big company after you graduate. Preferably one that can offer you health benefits, retirement benefits, pension plan, gold watch, you know, the whole nine. <laughs> and so Sarah said, okay, mom, okay, dad, that sounds good to me. So after graduating from high school, she went to Tate. She enrolled at UWF. And in doing so, she selected a degree in business. She said, Mom, Dad, there's nothing safe in the business. Okay, I'm going for business. They said, okay, that's fine. So for the next few years, Sarah did exactly what her parents told her to do. She didn't worry about uh, boyfriends. She didn't worry about clubs or sports or anything like that. All she did was study hard, got the grade, and it paid off. Because when she graduated with her bachelor's in uh, business administration, she had a 3.5 GPA, right? Not too bad. Sarah's going places, right? Roll out the red carpet for Sarah. So after graduation, she leased a little apartment, and she put out about a dozen or so applications and resumes, and she just sat back, waiting for the calls to come in. But something strange happened. Something really unusual happened. A few days went by, and then a few weeks went by, and nobody was calling to hire Sarah. So she said, okay, well, that's a bit bizarre, you know, could be the economy, you know, could be Obama doing something to me, I don't know what the situation is. <laughs> <laughs> so she put out another dozen or so applications, right? A few days went by. A few weeks went by, nobody was calling to hire Sarah. So still she wasn't worried. She said, look, I got a 3.5 GPA. They can't touch me out here, right? <laughs> My mom told me that if I got these good grades, that I'm going to be set. So I'm going to get this some job. Someone's going to take me in the business world. So she put out another dozen or so applications. <clears throat> Days went by, and a few weeks. I think you guys get what I'm saying, right? <laughs> okay, yeah. If you did before, now you do, right? So I would like to tell you that Sarah is in the business world today. I wish I could tell you that. The last time I spoke to her, however, she 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 did get a job, but it was at a waitress as a waitress, right? And. She was talking to me and she said, you know, Jared, it's frustrating. I did everything right. I did everything that I was supposed to and it still didn't work out for me. Sarah's story isn't unlike a lot of other college graduates. And in fact, as the years go on, it's becoming a more common reality. The age of getting a gold watch and a pension plan after working at a company for 50 years, are slowly becoming a fantasy, right? This idea of job security isn't really true anymore because we've seen people who have worked at a company at 10, 20 years that are looking for jobs right now, right? There's no pension plan for them. And the new college graduate is going to be stepping into a world that is far different than the one that our parents had to go through. And so I'd kind of like to share a few details about this new world so we're all up to date. Okay, how many of you in here are between the ages of 18 and 37? 18, 37. That's, that's, that's most of us, right? 
Not all of us. I know some people would like, ah. But uh, it mm -hmm. is most of us. So if you're between the ages of 18 and 37, then you are in a generation known as the millennials. Has anybody heard this before? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay. So let me tell you a couple things about us. One, there are more of us than there are of the baby boomers, a.k.a. your parents. There's about 85 uh, billion of us. That's a lot. And out of those 85 million, I'm sorry, that's a billion, 85 billion, uh, <laughs> that would be a lot. Wow. Could you imagine that world? I would not want to live there. Uh, <laughs> but anyway. 85 million in the States? Yeah, 85 million in the United States. And so out of those 85 million, the majority of us either have a college degree, some form of college training, or have ambitions to uh, graduate from college in the next few years. So we're on track to be one of the most educated generations out of any before. But when you look at other statistics, such as the fact that 54% of college graduates last year were either jobless or underemployed, meaning that they were working at a job that didn't even require a college degree, sounds sort of like Sarah, then we begin to face the facts that things are changing, and really there are two main things that we can take from this. One is that a college degree in and of itself is alone not enough <coughs> to land you that dream job that you may want. Now this is by no means saying that having a college degree isn't important, or you shouldn't go to college, because if I was to believe that, then I wouldn't even be in this room, right? I'd be way somewhere else. But it's not alone the decision maker. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that now more than ever, the job market is looking for professionals. Not just graduates, not just people, just dudes chilling. You know, uh, if you guys were here for the employment workshop, she talked a lot about being a professional, right? Talked about how to dress and what to say and things like that. Um, if you read articles, if you read a lot of news stuff, a lot of older people, older employers, don't think that young people, me and you, 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 all of us, aren't really capable of, of picking up where they left off, right? Because they say, oh, we don't know how to talk because we're, we're on Twitter so much. We don't know how to write because we text so much. <laughs> um, the craziest thing I'd ever heard, you know, I've heard people bringing their moms to job interviews, you know, their moms taking part in the job interview process. Like, yeah, Johnny's a good boy. Johnny's a good boy. You're going to like him. <laughs> the favorite, my, my most favorite one that I heard actually was um, I was talking to a manager at a marketing firm downtown, and he was saying that he had an applicant lined up. Um, who actually brought his dog to the job interview. And it wasn't like a service dog or anything like that. The guy wasn't blind. He just said, oh, well, you know, uh, Pookie gets lonely without me. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you, if you bring your job, or if you bring your dog to a job interview, the dog has more of a chance of getting a job than you do. I'm just going to tell you that right now. So how do we begin to close this gap? How can we gain this competitive edge to separate ourselves from all of the people who are bringing their dogs to job interviews? Don't bring your dog. That's the first thing I want to share with you today. If you learn nothing else from me, don't bring your dog to a job interview. <laughs> okay, Rover will forgive you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but let's talk about this first thing. And that is an attitude of service. Okay. My second job interview lasted 45 seconds max. Yeah, well, at least no longer than 45 seconds. Okay, let me explain. Does everybody know that fresh market over there? Yeah. Okay, okay. Some people are passionate about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you. Um, there was a time before that fresh market was fully built. You guys remember that? Okay, before it was there? Yeah. Okay, before they had fully renovated or built the place, they had an interview fair downtown. 
And if you don't know what an interview fair is, basically, it's where the company, in this case, Fresh Market, rents out a ballroom to a swanky hotel, puts a lot of tables and chairs in there, and waits for a swarm of jobless people, such as myself, to, to just go through and take a ticket, right? So you go in, you take a ticket, and once they call your name, call your number on the ticket, then you go up, shake hands with the manager, and have a five minute interview session. And based on that interview, they determine whether or not they want to try to explore the possibility of hiring you on further or if they just want to throw your resume away. So it's sort of like speed dating for managers. So at the time, I had just gotten fired from Chili's, although if you had asked me then, I said that you know we had reached a mutual agreement that my skills would be better suited elsewhere. <laughs> and uh, when I heard about it, my sister had told me, and you know, I love the way she said it. She said, you know, Jared, I have great news for you. I heard you just got fired. Well, I said, well, wait a minute. That's not great news, first of all. <laughs> and second of all, I was there. I could have told you that happened. <laughs> she said, no, you got to come down. So, okay. I, so, okay, I throw on my nice khakis. It might have been these khakis, actually. I think it was these khakis. Okay. That, okay, that's not the point. So, I go down, <laughs> take a number. Take a, uh, take a number, sit down. When my number's called, I stand up, meet this lady. She looks like she's been through 20 other people and not too happy to see me. But anyway, we shake hands, go to a table. And she says, look, I just have three basic questions that I ask everybody. I said, okay, three questions. I can do this. I can get this job. She said, the first question, how are you doing today? I said, okay, I'm excellent. How are you? Boom. Got the first question. One out of three people looking so good. All right, looking good. Okay. The second thing is, the second thing that she asked me was, tell me a little bit about yourself. Now, I don't know, uh, how many of you guys have actually been in a job interview before, most of them? Okay. All right. Has anyone ever been asked that question? Okay. Now, it's a simple question enough, but when you're actually asked the question, if you like me, you get nervous and you forget everything about yourself, right? You start to forget your last name and stuff, right? So I said, um... Okay, uh, um, uh, my name is, 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 is Jared, and I went to, to Tate, and uh, I, go to, I go to PSC now, and um, yeah, and I, oh, and I'm eager to work again, um, so there's that. So I'm like, boom, stuck the landing, right? <laughs> um, so I'm thinking, okay, so the second one was a little, you know, a little shaky, but I think I get the third one. They said, okay, here's the last question. Why should I hire you over anybody else out here? Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so that was around the 45 second mark. And as you can guess, I, I, uh, I didn't know what to say to that because all I, wanted, because all I knew is that I needed money. <laughs> I was starting college, and I needed money for Subway, Building 5. You know, that was a big part of my life. Um, putting gas in my car. Just living my life, you know. So, I, so, so, so when she had asked me that, I said, um, uh, you know how you try to lie? You know, you said, um, I'm really passionate about, about fresh food. <laughs> I really like fresh food. And, um, and uh, I think that... That what I that what I have to offer can um, uh, the fresh food. Did I mention about the fresh the fresh food? <laughs> so there's a reason why I didn't get hired, right? I was so focused on what I could get from the job, right? All I was thinking about was, okay, can I make money? Can I get money from you? But the one thing that I didn't consider. <laughs> Is from my manager's point of view, which was, what value are you to me? I want us all to just play a little scenario in our heads real quick. Imagine that you are a uh, captain of a ship, a cargo ship. Okay? You, have we all got it in our heads here real quick? Cargo ship? Okay. So, if someone raised up to you, right, one of your crewmates and said, Captain, the ship is sinking because there's so much crap on this ship. What are we going to do? You're the captain, so what are we going to do? 
Okay, okay, so we're gonna throw some stuff off. Okay, that's great. Are we gonna throw our water overboard? No. Are we gonna throw our food overboard? No. What about our children or our boyfriends or girlfriends? Are we gonna throw them overboard? Yeah. Maybe, only if they make us mad, right? <laughs> only if they make us a little mad, right? No, we're gonna throw everything that is not absolutely essential to the function of the ship and the survival of the crew, right? We're in times where managers have to play the part of the captain and their, build, their business, their boat, is slowly sinking. So when they do these five minute interviews or when they do any job interview, the only question they're really trying to figure out is, are you going to be essential to me? Are you going to help the function of the ship or the, uh, or the health of the crew? Or are you going to just be some crap that I'm gonna need to throw out when times get hard? Okay, we get it. So, um, there's an answer to that question. Why should I hire you over anybody else out here? You know, there's an actual answer to that. Uh, has anyone seen the movie uh, Taken? Right, has anyone seen? Yes. Yeah, sort of, okay, we like the movie Taken? Like the first one, I mean. Yeah. Okay, now, now, uh, now you know the part in the movie where the girl gets snatched from underneath the bed and Lee Neeson's on the phone? Yeah. Okay, and, and then the guy who kidnaps the girl picks up the phone and Lee Neeson starts talking? Right, and he says, look, okay, now I don't remember the whole monologue. I have a special set of skills. I have a, I, I have a special set of skills. Right, I don't have money, but I have a particular set of skills. Exactly. I will find you. I will find you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's just like, dude, you know, that's just like college students. We don't have money, oftentimes, but what we do have or what we need to get is a particular set of skills. And then we can find our employer, not like in a weird way, not like, I will find you. Because I, I will kill, kill you. you. <laughs> not the last part. Not like, I will find you, and you will hire me. Right? Sort of like on that. Good look. <laughs> yeah. yeah really. <laughs> so, we are paid in, in proportion to the value that we have to offer. In order to get special opportunities, which is people hiring you, people you uh, putting you on for promotion or whatever the case may be, you need a special set of skills to complement that, right? To add to that. So, I want to talk about three ways or three three techniques that we can use to begin getting the skills to make us valuable after we graduate from PFC and go on. Okay. The first one would be in Identifying what what counts as a special skill in your field. If you're going to be a nurse, for instance, you can't put that you won the chili cook-off of 2014 on your resume. Right? I know it was cool. I'm sure people loved it. But that skill isn't relevant to what you're doing. Right? We need to look for the relevant skills which our employers find value in. So when, talk, so when you talk about skills, there's really two types. There's the hard skills and the soft skills. The hard skills is the stuff that we learn in the classroom. It's the math, it's the, it, you know, if you're in the medical field, it's the techniques, all that stuff. But the soft skills are things that you can't learn in the classroom. Like communication, being able to work in a team, showing leadership ability. And most of the time, what employees are finding is that though we have the hard skills, we lack the soft skills. You know, some of us can't really communicate that well with people. You know, we can't really work in a team sometimes. I know that was me. I know that if I worked in a group project with people, for instance, I wouldn't want to work with anybody else because I just feel like everybody else was going to screw me up. You know, my mom used to tell me, son, Always assume that somebody's going to do something stupid because they're rarely going to disappoint you. I said, thanks for the pep talk, Mom. That really, that really brought me up. Yeah. So, so the first thing that we need to do is begin to focus in on trying to find out what those soft skills are. If you're you know, uh, going to be in business, yes, having a knowledge of law, finance, all that stuff is good, but can you have a conversation with people? You know, these are things that we need to know. So that's the first thing. 
The second thing is in beginning to apply those skills, finding ways to cultivate that skill set. And this is usually where people get messed up because um, I, I don't know if you guys remember back before you had a job, if you guys remember what that day was like, but we all, but we all know the job catch 22, right? The job catch 22 is, okay, I need experience to get a job, but I need a job to get experience, right? Well, luckily being in college, we get to take advantage of all of the great opportunities here that can help develop our skill set without us actually having to have a job. You know, for one, clubs. You know, I think clubs are the greatest thing just ever. Um, and I attribute a large amount to my small successes in life. And I haven't been here that long, just 20 years. But I attribute a vast amount of that to the fact that, you know, I've been in Phi Theta Kappa. And I've been able to do things there that has allowed me to be even in this position, where I wasn't always a natural speaker, but there you go. So, um, clubs and also learning a lot about your field. You know, not waiting for graduate school, no, no, not waiting later down the line. We have to prepare for the opportunity as though we already have the opportunity now. Because, like John said, when something along the lines of when you prepare for the opportunity, then you open yourself up to accept it when it comes. And the third thing, and the final thing that I'd like to share with you guys is to recognize and manage your own personal brand and communicate that brand. We all know Coke has a brand, right? We all know Coke's brand. We all know Pepsi's brand. But every single person in this room right now has a personal brand. When you walk out of a room, people say things about you, right? I mean, it's probably in their heads, right? They're not always talking about you, but I'm saying people think about you. And it's up to you to determine whether or not these things are good or these things are bad. Because it's easy to say, well, you know, you can't judge a book by its cover. All right? And I wish we lived in a world like that. You know, I wish our bosses thought that way. Or our future bosses thought that way. But unfortunately, employers do judge a book by its cover. Right? So if you walk in, like when the lady was giving the employability workshop, and you walk in with your pants half down, talking about what it do, you know, that, that, that job interview may last shorter than mine. <laughs> it may last shorter than 45 seconds. Um, I, uh, and this is the power that a personal brand has. I have a friend who is a good guy, right? He's a friendly guy, nice, funny, but he's always late to things. Always late. And I'm not just talking about like a little late, because right, you can forgive that. I'm talking about like an hour late. So because we knew his brand, every time we made events, we had to tell him that the event was an hour before when it actually was. Because if we told him that it was at 6, he would show up at 7. So we had to tell him it was at 5 and pray that he got there by 545. <laughs> That's clever. So <laughs> now there's a couple of ways right now that we could just work on managing our brand. And one of the few which you already kind of touched upon in the workshop is like your email address, for instance. You know, not your student account. I'm just talking about your Yahoo or your Gmail. You know, you can't have Thugboy26 at your Yahoo anymore. That, okay, that's John's, everybody, if you want to hit John up on Yahoo. Thugboy26. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can't put Lil Wayne's the best at gmail.com. Right. Can't do that. Can't do that. Right now, I know we all have like that one, that one email address that we just don't like to tell people because it's embarrassing. <laughs> That's off topic. And then the last thing is simply dressing the part when you're at the interview. You know, uh, knowing the difference between formal and you know, not just 
walking in with jeans and a t-shirt talking about what's up, how can I get this job? Because it's not going to work out that way. So just to cover what we talked about, if you want to get the job that you want, in essence, just identify what skills are valuable. Then you can utilize some, the, the clubs on campus, the clubs even off campus, to develop those skills. And finally, manage and, I, and try to work on that personal brand. And that's it for me, guys. Thank you very much. Oh.